So now we'll move on to how does this apply to something that's of great interest in these GLP-1 agents um, with lipedema? What are the benefits? What are the limitations? So I talked a little bit about leptin in the last talk and the regulation of appetite. And we often think that appetite regulation is, is more of a conscious decision than a physiologic decision, but it really is driven by our physiology. We have hunger hormones called ghrelin. We have leptin, which is made by our fat cells. We have insulin and amylin, which are made in the pancreas. But we're gonna focus on today is something that's made in the gastrointestinal tract. These are naturally, GLP-1 and GIP are naturally made in the body that send a signal to our brain to create a satiety effect. So that, that signal to the brain is, creates a sense of fullness and, and decreases the desire to eat. So there's a couple that are specifically um, uh, approved for the treatment of obesity. Uh, liraglutide has been around since 2014, I believe. Uh, and more recently, semaglutide is sold as Wegovi and terzepatide, a Zepbound, uh, are approved for the treatment of obesity. Zepbound being different in that it works on both GLP-1 and GIP, those two pathways. So I'm gonna use a case study here. A 50-year-old female with lipedema had a max weight of 317. She lost 88 pounds with a Ruin Y bypass surgery in 2019. She started, she was also following a low carbohydrate diet. She plateaued at about 200 with increased size in her buttocks and legs, uh, and which were also painful, limiting her ambulation and sitting. Um, and so she was started on semaglutide. So we'll come back to her. Um, so what do these agents do? Well, they are proof for diabetes, and the way they really help diabetes is they improve our uh, response to a food challenge, when we consume food, then we need to produce insulin and it enhances that response. It also decreases, decreases glucagon. Glucagon is something that our liver makes that increases our blood sugar and people with diabetes keep making it even though they're eating. When you don't have diabetes, you should shut that off. Uh, they slow gastric emptying, which causes a sense of fullness and that has a, a satiety benefit in of itself and a central satiety effect, which means in the brain, it makes you want to eat less. So some of the lesser known facts about uh, GLP-1s and, and effects that are known is that it increases that brown fat that I talked about. So that increases that brown fat activity. It increases adiponectin. If you remember from the last lecture, adiponectin was the good player in all of this. It had the anti-inflammatory effect uh, in the body. It improves adipocyte function so that the adipocytes work better uh, through GLP-1 activity and it improves adipocyte differentiation so we can make more healthier adipocytes. Also has a very interesting effect on cravings that people will say that I just, one of the things that I commonly hear from people is that the food chatter has stopped. I was always thinking about food and as soon as I started taking this, uh, I, I stop thinking about food all the time. Uh, other areas of cravings, decreasing alcohol intake, decreasing gambling, one, per, one woman even told me, said she didn't feel the urge to shop anymore. <laughs> that could pay for the high cost in and of itself, right? So what do the GIPs do? Uh, so that, that what is the role of GIP? So I mentioned this um, terzepatide as the, is a combination of GLP-1 and GIP. GIP standing for this glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide receptor agonist, which is why we call it GIP. Um, so it's been approved for diabetes. It does um, improve how our body responds to food. It actually increases glucagon, so it's count but that effect is counterbalanced by GIP-1. It sends a signal to the brain to create a sense of fullness, um, but it also improves blood flow to those adipocytes, those white blood cells, and remember that one of the things that I had on the list there of what makes an adipocyte healthy and what makes a fat cell healthy is when it has a good blood supply. Um, and that in turn can reduce inflammation and dysfunction in the body. And that uh, actually 
it, it actually increases the number of fat cells in the body. It increases your body, your ability to form new fat cells. Now, why is that good? Because if your body fat is going to increase, it can increase one of two ways. Those cells can get bigger, the existing fat cells can get bigger, or you can make more new ones. And I use the an analogy of say, you know, 12 people wanted to go up in an elevator and there was only one elevator and you squeeze 12 people in there and it's gonna get kind of hot and uncomfortable. If you had three bays of elevators and four people can go in each one, it's fine. Um, and that's kind of what happens if there's excess calories that need to be stored. If we can store a little bit in a lot of different cells, it's not going to cause inflammation. If we have to pile it all into a couple of cells, it's going to cause more inflammation. So that's where it provides a benefit from that inflammatory. So with lipedema fat, we tend to see adipocyte hypertrophy where those, swells are, those cells are larger and swollen. We see the lower adiponectin, lower levels of the good guy, um, and impaired adipocyte blood flow, so that the blood, the, the blood flow to those fat cells is not as good as it should be. And so the GLP-1s and GIPs are going to improve the number of blood, uh, fat cells through this adipogenesis, carrying new cells, increasing uh, adiponectin, and improving that blood flow. So those are some of the benefits that we're seeing there. We also see when you reduce calorie intake, that reduces, so what are some of the good things about this? It can reduce your calorie intake, which means you're gonna put less of a load into that system. So that whole chart that I showed, it keeps the excess from occurring. Um, it improves how they how, uh, adipocyte function and inflammation by decreasing appetite, slowing that gastric emptying, and eating less, which lowers insulin demand and is going to decrease the circulating fat in the body. So inflammation goes down, as we mentioned, with, with uh, leptin, less normal, or with lipedema, you normally have less uh, adiponectin in large cells. GIP, GLP-1 are going to help reverse that. But there's a lot of, with the good comes the bad, right? And there's a lot of um, talk about are, are these, can these be harmful or are these harmful in some way? And so what are some of the risks that we see with this? One of the risks that we see with the GLP-1 and GIPs is excessive calorie restriction. So one of the expressions that's commonly used in this country is that we live to eat. Uh, that food is such a big part of our culture, of our social life. Um, but and, and hunger is also one of the things that drives that, uh, that part, part of that. When you take the hunger away, sometimes there's just no desire to eat at all. Uh, and that may sound beneficial until you overly calorie restrict. And if you restrict too many calories, then your body's not gonna get the nutrients it needs. It's not all about cutting calories. We have to make sure that we're getting the right calories. And this is well known with bariatric surgery. They're very uh, prescriptive as to what you should be eating after bariatric surgery. You need to be the same way with ma these medications if you're taking them. You need to prioritize protein in your diet. You need to make sure you're getting adequate uh, vegetables in your diet. And you prioritize, prioritize those first and then eat everything else. So instead of uh, eating to, uh, living to eat, you eat to live, and, and that becomes an important part of eating strategy. We want to prevent protein malnutrition. We want to make sure we're getting a minimum amount of protein, typically 1.2 to 1.6 uh, grams per kilogram of ideal body weight per day. So, and, and that's going to translate to most people for somewhere between 60 and 100 grams of protein a day, depending upon your, your height. One of the other complications is fat intolerance. So we just had a uh, lecture on utilizing a high fat ketogenic diet, which is, can be very helpful because it lowers insulin levels, right? It lowers that fat storage. Uh, so you can see, you get a real benefit with lipedema. But the problem on these agents is that very often people don't tolerate the fat very well, that it tends to cause more nausea. Uh, associated with that. 
Um, and then for many of the patients that I see with lipedema, uh, they have had times in their lives where they've been excessive in their restriction, when they've gone too far in terms of restricting because you know, you're not getting the normal response, the expected response that you would have with calorie restriction. So it gets more and more and more severe, and sometimes that leads into dysfunctional eating. And so that is another risk. Are we, will you reactivate that kind of mindset? And I have patients come in and they'll tell me, oh, I skipped breakfast, I skipped lunch, I had some cheese and crackers for dinner, and that's about it. And it's like, whoa, that's like, that's not enough. You're not getting the nutrients your body needs. And when you don't get enough protein in your diet, that's where you get the muscle loss. And so there's a lot of controversy about, you know, well, it's causing muscle wasting. Well, it can cause muscle wasting if you don't get adequate protein in your diet, if you don't in, can, in, engage with the other lifestyle components, uh, engaging in regular exercise, particularly strength training. So you have to, it's very important to, lose, to, to maintain your muscle mass. Typically when people lose weight, they're losing both fat and muscle. In fact, it's often about a pound of fat for every two pounds of, mu of uh, I mean, a pound of muscle for every two pounds of fat that you lose. So you can lose a lot of muscle very quickly if you're not getting adequate protein, if you're not engaging in regular exercise. General side effects, reflux is a common uh, disorder with this delayed gastric emptying. And this is where we had, there's a, was a question I got about gastroparesis and does this cause gastroparesis? Well, we don't know, see evidence that it causes gastroparesis, but gastroparesis is common with diabetes and it can unmask an existing gastroparesis. Or if a patient has gastroparesis, I wouldn't prescribe it. Diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting are common side effects, although they tend to be transient. As you're on them longer, they're less. Pancreatitis is a rare side effect uh, that, that is sometimes mentioned. And so what are the benefits of this? Well, certainly these medications are very effective in reducing generalized obesity. If there's both lipedema and visceral fat, then it's going to help particularly with that visceral fat component. And just like you see in, in women who have lipedema that have had bariatric surgery, the weight loss tends to be in this region, right? In this central part of the region. And it's very effective for that, which may also improve you as a candidate for surgery if, you are, if your BMI uh, is making, that, making you not a candidate for that. Um, it helps you to adhere to a dietary plan. If you're going to follow a low carbohydrate diet, if you're going to follow an anti-inflammatory diet, if you're not hungry all the time, it's a lot easier to do that. And so that can improve adherence. Uh, it can improve adipocyte function that we talked about to reduce inflammation uh, and reduce uh, the pain associated with that so you get symptomatic improvement. But the risks are malnutrition from not getting an adequate amount of um, protein, of fiber in your diet, of getting adequate vegetable intake, side effects that can occur. Um, and you may not see as big a, a change in your lipedema tissue. And in fact, in the case uh, that I had, the, the patient had lost 15 pounds uh, since starting semaglutide, um, but didn't have any change in her measurements. Um, however, once she got to the 1.7 milligram dose, her pain got markedly better. Um, so she, perhaps through that change in adipocyte function that she saw improvement. So I find these agents are very effective for generalized obesity. They also, they're good at reducing that unhealthy visceral fat that leads to metabolic dysfunction. Um, they can improve how well our body fat cells work uh, in the body. They also um, uh, can help with that more android weight that individuals have. Uh, they can improve symptoms associated with this, with lipedema. Um, but may not necessarily reduce uh, the amount of lipidema tissue that you have. One area that I think might be of, of great interest is what role can these play after you have lipidema reduction surgery? Can they help prevent um, recurrence of the lipidema tissue, if that is a, a possibility, or can they prevent 
body fat from forming other areas that normally would have been forming in the lipedema areas. So that's something I think of great interest, but we certainly need a lot more uh, information and research on this area. Thank you.